it's a joy for me to watch them grow up, but it's also to be on the receiving end of the many blessings that they show to us and now that they're showing to, uh, to all of us here. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 4, verses 22 to 25. We're taking a break away from, I really kind of struggle with this. We're going through 1 Corinthians, as you know, on Sunday mornings. And 1 Corinthians 15, when you get to the end of that, that's just the, that's the crescendo chapter on the resurrection. But we're a long way from that. We're just in chapter 3. So I thought we would hone in this morning on something uh, that Paul has to say to the church at Rome, chapter 4 of Romans, verses 22 to 25. Uh, turn in your Bible, if you would. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you, but I want to uh, do everything in my power to give you your own Bible so you can have one to read on your own and read uh, for yourself as we, as we work through these things. I never want you to take what I'm saying just because I'm saying it. I, I want you to be Bereans. I want you to search the Scriptures and see if the things we're telling you are true according to the Word of God. Today we're looking at this the idea of the resurrection and our justification. It's a big word. We've talked about it through the years. In fact, I was thinking the other day, the first sermon I ever preached to you as your pastor, and I know that those of you who are here remember it. You've not forgotten nearly 12 years ago we did that. But the first sermon I ever preached was the doctrine of justification, the standing or falling doctrine of the church. That was Martin Luther's observation in the Reformation. If, that if, by the way, we're celebrating the 500th year of the Reformation this year, that if the doctrine of justification is lost to Christianity, then Christianity is lost. It, 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 it'll, it'll crumble. It'll not stand anymore. And Paul has some things to say about justification in Romans, if you're familiar with that, with that letter to the church at Rome. And I wanted to take just a snippet out of that today and look at this idea of the, the, uh, the, the resurrection and our justification. We're going to get into a definition of that in all in a minute. Stand with me if you would and follow along in your Bibles or on the screen as I read these verses to you. In the context here, Paul is talking about Abraham and how Abraham found uh, grace in the eyes of the Lord, how he was justified before God uh, by faith when God, remember, had told him, uh, leave your country, leave your kinsmen, I'm going to send you to a place that I will show you. And so he left Ur of the Chaldees and journeyed uh, until God showed him where he wanted him to be, and he made him promises along the way. Go look at the stars in the sky. If you can number them, that's going to be the number of your uh, offspring. And then look at the sands of the sea. If you can number them, that's, that's how you're... And Abraham, when he told, Abraham didn't have a child when he told him this. And so Paul is talking about this whole idea of Abraham being justified before God, but he points out that it wasn't just for Abraham that God told him. He told it for us too. Look at this. This is why his, that is Abraham's faith, was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We want it to teach us today. We want the Holy Spirit to show us uh, the implications, the blessings, uh, the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as it has to do with our being made right before a holy God. Thank you. Please be seated. It's already been observed that, that today is the Sunday. I mean, we, any evangelical Christians celebrate Resurrection Sunday 52, 53 times a year because every time we gather on the first day of the week, we're gathering on the first day of the week because Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week. But no doubt, all over the world today, folks are honed in, focused in, some paying more attention to the fact that Jesus died and rose from the grave than some will for at any other time in the course of the year. And so we want to put our emphasis on that as well. It's Resurrection Sunday, arguably the highest holy day for Christianity. Through the years, uh, I've preached a lot of sermons to you, uh, about 12 or so now, uh, and it's not unusual to hear sermons, and I've preached some myself, which, which go into demonstrating to, to prove the historical reality of the resurrection is not a hoax, not a fable, not a clever idea some guys made up. And that's appropriate. But I think it's also appropriate sometimes 
to, to back away from the defense of the resurrection and move into declaring the powerful reality and implications of the resurrection. I would encourage you, by the way, if you've not gone to see the movie A Case for Christ, to put that on your list of things to do. Uh, it's a great uh, movie about our Savior and his reality, and it'll show a lot of historical realities, and it should take away from any thoughtful person the notion that these are just myths and fables. We're talking history here, redemptive history. I want you to consider the benefits of Jesus rising from the grave, as was put, put in a song that we just sang. The resurrected king is in the business of resurrecting sinners to live for him all the days of our lives as his followers. I want you to see in this passage, just for a few minutes here this morning, first of all, faith in the resurrection is essential to our salvation. Secondly, the force of the resurrection concerning our justification. Let's try to unpack that. First of all, faith in the resurrection is essential to our salvation. Verses 22 uh, through 24, that's why his faith, Abraham's faith, was counted to him as righteousness, Paul says. He's taking that from, uh, from Genesis 15, 5, and 6. God said, was teaching, he brought him outside, God did, to Abraham. He said, look toward heaven. Number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he, that is Abraham, believed the Lord. Think about that. A man who was past the age of the, of the physical, biological capacity to father children. Married to a woman who was past the age of the physical, biological capacity to conceive a child. He believed God. And he that is God counted or credited to him as righteousness. Abraham is set up in Hebrews 11 in that, in that hero's hall of faith as an example of how to walk by faith, not by sight. If Abraham had gone by sight, but much to look at, but much to hope for. But by faith, he believed God. And, of course, God brought it to, to pass. He ultimately gave birth to Isaac miraculously. And then on and on. You know the rest of the story. But these words, Paul says in verse 23, it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. This was not, this was not only, it was a powerful blessing of God to Abraham and Sarah, but it was not only for him. Because it wasn't primarily about a couple having a child. It was about God using Abraham as a vessel to unfold his plan of redeeming humanity. It was not for him alone. Verse 24, but for ours also. And just as Abraham, believing God, was credited for what we, what we call imputed righteousness. Big words, let's break them down. Righteousness is, if you, if you, if you catechize your children, our, our children were catechized and they're small, and if you ask our little children, what is, what is righteousness? The, the children's catechism answer is, it is God's goodness. In other words, the goodness of God is credited to us as if we ourselves were good. We know that the, in Isaiah, the prophet, God spoke to the prophet and said, your righteousness, your idea of goodness is, is filthy rags compared to God's goodness. We need God's goodness. Imputed, not, uh, it's, a, it's a court term. The picture here, by the way, in justification, you've heard it before, I'm sure, is that of you being found guilty and brought before the court and the court reads the charges, and you plead guilty, you don't try to weasel your way out, and the judge is too smart for you to do that to him. And then one steps forward and says, Your Honor, I pay that fine for him, 
for her. And the judge accepts the payment of another as a substitute for your crime. So the judge then declares you not guilty as if you had never committed the crime, not because you found a way to come up with something on your own, but because another had done that. That is imputed righteousness. That is God counting the works of another on your behalf. And all we must do is receive it by faith. Say, yes, I believe I, I receive that. And live with incredible thankfulness all of our days. But for ours also, it'll be counted to us who believe in him. Notice where the resurrection comes in, into play here. Who raised from the dead Jesus, our Lord. Later on in Romans, in chapter 10, Paul is talking about uh, if, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. We've talked about this before. I want to just show you again. Notice what he, he has told us, how we see that humanly, what, how we observe that. And then he gives us that little word for. And I had a professor in seminary who said, when you come across the word for, you need to ask us, you know, the word therefore, ask yourself, what is it there for? What, what's, he, what's he shifting? What's he showing here? For, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For, it is with the heart that a man believes and is justified. And it's with the mouth that confession is made salvation. Notice what he's, he's, he's reversed it. He's given us, first of all, the human observation. We observe a person confessing faith in Christ and in believing the best about him, unless there's evidence to prove contrary, when he confesses faith in Christ, we believe that that's coming out of a heart that believes that God raised Jesus from the dead. But the, but the operation that we don't see, the internal spiritual Operation is that a person first believes in his heart and he's justified. And it's that belief in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on our behalf that then issues forth the true confession which gives us hope that the person is saved. Paul's talking a little bit about this here. To believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Well, Paul has a, often speaks of God raising Jesus. I want to just show you a few, just a few verses this morning to give you a little appetite. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. And there he's talking about how, how it was the, the power of this resurrection, that Jesus was really dead in the tomb. And God, by his power, the power of his spirit, brought him back from the dead. And he says, that's the kind of thing he does for you when he saves you. He will raise us up. Because Ephesians, of course, teaches in Ephesians 2 that you were, you were born, you and I were born dead in trespasses and sins. That's how we come. We don't come into this world neutral. We come into this world dead in trespasses and sins under the judgment of God. But you has he made alive. You has he raised from the dead. And so there was this, there's this powerful action of God upon our lives. Paul says, just like he brought Jesus from the dead, he will also bring us by his power. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, we're going to, we'll get to that uh, in the months ahead. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. He's making his argument there, of course, that there are some that say, well, the dead, the dead don't rise. Jesus, and Paul says, if that's true, then pity us. Because our whole hope is tied to the fact that Jesus came out of the tomb three days later. If that doesn't happen, that doesn't happen, then we're misrepresenting God. Pitiful. 2 Corinthians 4.14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Notice the connection here when Paul talks about the resurrection. He's, he points to the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to encourage us about, about our own uh, resurrecting, uh, as we sang of earlier. And then Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, as he introduces himself to the churches in, in Galatia. Paul, an apostle, not from men or through man, 
but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So he introduces himself in the letter as an apostle of Jesus Christ whom God the Father raised from the dead. So the resurrection is very critical, very important. I want you to see, secondly, the force of resurrection concerning our justification. He goes on in verse 5 to say, who, it's Jesus, was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. This idea of being delivered up or delivered over, it's a judicial term. He was handed over. And we know what happened historically, physically. He was, he was arrested after Judas betrayed him. We had a wonderful, by the way, just a sweet, reflective Good, good Friday service here, Friday night with, uh, with six congregations gathered and seven ministers from those congregations. As we went through the seven words of Jesus Christ, if you, if you missed it, you missed probably the only time in my pastoral history that I spoke for three minutes, but that's, that's okay. That's what we were assigned. It was sweet, reflecting on the death of Jesus. He was delivered over. We know that happened physically. The, the Sanhedrin paid Judas. Judas told him where to find Jesus. There, the, the temple police went and arrested him, handed him over to the Romans, who beat him beyond recognition, treated him mercilessly, handed him to Pilate, who finally said, crucify him. Let's crucify him. I don't want to. That's what the crowd wants to do, and they did that. We know that happened. But that's not what Paul's emphasizing here. He was delivered up. Jesus was not crucified by the Romans because they were upset with the sins of the Jews. He was crucified by the Romans because they were upset that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. He claimed to be a king, an authority that might challenge Herod, the puppet king, or, or Pilate, the, the procurator who represented Rome. No, no. Paul's talking about Jesus being delivered up for our trespasses because we were sinners and we deserve to die. We deserve the judgment of God, the wrath of God. If I got what was coming to me, then at some point in my life after I was born, I would have died and been cast into an eternal torment. But Jesus was delivered up because of my sins, because of your sins, to, to satisfy God's holy righteousness, to satisfy the demands of his law, which says you keep the whole law or you suffer the penalty of the whole law. And Jesus did keep the whole law. I remind you, my pastor friend Fred Malone says, Jesus Christ was the law walking. If you want to see what it means to obey God, look at Jesus' life. He also says you can sum the gospel up sometimes that, that Christ the law giver, God the law giver gave Christ the law keeper to die for law breakers. Jesus satisfied the holy requirements of God's law. We say he satisfied divine justice by his suffering and death in our place. He was, he was delivered up because of our sins. That's sad, but it's true. Romans 8.32, later on Paul says, He, that is God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's, the, it's Jesus being delivered up by the Father to die the painful, shameful death of the cross. And in a way that we could not have seen there except with the eye of faith, to take sin upon himself. He became sin who knew no sin, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, that we might become his righteousness. So in his death, his delivering up, he does so because of our sin. But he's raised. Here's the good news. 
He's raised for our justification. Now, it's interesting how Paul, Paul shifts the use of the preposition there. The first one is he was, he was handed over to be crucified to die in our place. The second use of the preposition is, but his being raised from the dead is the reason and the only way that we can be justified. Let's talk about the word a minute. The word justification, it's a big word, multisyllabic, but it, but it simply means to be, to be declared not guilty and accepted as righteous or as good, innocent, in the sight of God. If you have a right standing with God here today, it's not because of any of, of your parents, your grandparents, anything you have ever done or anything you can ever do. If you have a right standing with God today, it is only and uniquely and exclusively because Jesus Christ died and rose again on your behalf and you have received that by trusting in Him. Three fundamental questions that every human being who has ever lived, who ever will live, must answer correctly. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, I think it's Josh McDowell who wrote the book, said Jesus is either a Lord, or He's a liar, or He's a lunatic. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed that He was going to die to take away sin. If that's not true, then he's a liar or he's a lunatic. But if it is true, and it is, he is Lord. Who is Jesus Christ? The eternal Son of God who came, born of a woman, born under the law, who lived a perfect holy life without sin, something I have not done, still to this day do not do, something you have never done, and will not do as long as you're on this earth. But he did, never sinning. Qualifying himself to die in our place. Who is Jesus Christ? What did he do? What did he come to do? Well, he came to live the life we should have lived and to die the death we should have died in our place and rise from the grave three days later. Those are two fundamental questions. The person and work of Jesus Christ. Volumes and volumes and volumes have been written on them by very capable theologians. But the third question is the crux of the matter for you and me. We've got to get the first two right. But the third question is the crux. A lot of people know the first and the second. The question, the third one is, what difference, if any, has this made in your life? Because if it hasn't, if you've not received him, then knowing who he was and knowing what he came to do will not help you in the final day. One writer said, our sin had killed him. Our justification raised him again. His resurrection was the proof of our justification only because it was the necessary effect of it. How do I know that I can be saved today? How do I know that you can be saved today? Because the tomb of Jesus Christ is empty. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. That's our great hope. It's our hope of being found right with God. It's our hope of being declared not guilty and knowing that God will accept us. Let me go back to the courtroom scene I'm planning for you a while ago. You're standing guilty. No doubt that you're guilty. You know you're guilty. The judge knows you're guilty. He's read your crimes. No way to water it down. No way to tone it down. They're true, every one. You're ready to be sentenced. You're waiting to hear the judge say, found guilty and sentenced to, and then whatever your sentence is. And then one steps forward who says, I have paid for his crimes. I paid his debt. And the judge looks at the advocate, one who has, without, without our inquiry, volunteered to be our attorney. And the judge says, my son, I accept your payment for his crime. 
He looks at us, the judge does, and he says, not guilty, you are free to go. That is justification. The resurrection secures that. But oh, brothers and sisters, when you turn to go, and you're, and you're amazed, you're shocked. So, what? How can this be? Expecting to be sentenced, and now I've been freed? You begin to walk out of the courtroom, and you hear the judge say, my son. And you think he's speaking to your advocate. He's already called him his son. He says it again, my son. And you realize he's talking to me. You turn, and he says, I want you to come home with me. I want to adopt you. I want to raise you to be like my firstborn son. That is the fruit. That's the blessings and benefit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because all who are justified by his life, death, burial, and resurrection are welcomed into the family of God. In Romans 5, 18, Paul says this about this same word, this this justification. In fact, it's only this particular word in this form is only used twice. Though the idea is throughout the New Testament, this word is only used twice. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, the life of Jesus, leads to justification and life for all men. And if you keep on reading past Romans 4, 22 to 25, you'll notice chapter 5 of Romans begins. And I just want to read this and stop. Therefore. In other words, what's that therefore? In the light of this, since we have been justified, since we have been declared not guilty and accepted as righteous in his sight, by faith, we have peace with God. You see, before you're justified, uh, you may think good of God, but you're, you're not at peace with God. He has a controversy with you. He's a judge that you have not met and settled matters with. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have, it's ongoing there, we are having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have al we've also obtained access to God by faith and to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Notice how the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes sufferings not futile and meaningless, but purposeful. Notice we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. The only reason our sufferings can work for our good and God's glory is because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That event 2,000 years ago, as one fellow said, the resurrection changes everything. You know, you read that on Facebook a lot. It drives me crazy. Some article, this changes everything. And you read about it and you go, it doesn't change a thing. That's just... Folks, this changes everything. My question to you today is, have you trusted from your heart in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in your place, confessed him with your mouth to be your Lord, believing that God raised him from the dead so you could be declared not guilty and accepted as righteous and so Have you done that? Because if you've not, or not yet, if you've not, then what I've just shared the last few minutes with you will simply be information for you, but it will have no life-changing effect that gives you the capacity to live a life of hope and of victory. My prayer is that every one of you here has either trusted in Jesus Christ, confessed him as Lord and is living for him, or that those of you who have not yet taken him at his word in this area soon will. In the early church, they had a way to greet one another after the resurrection. If they gathered, they would do this in their gatherings. One would say, he is risen. The church would respond, he is risen indeed. It's our hope. 
That's our hope. The resurrected king resurrected me and is continuing to resurrect me, giving me life, conquering grace to grow more like him. I pray that that's true of you as well. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name, and we're so thankful we can gather today and sing these wonderful songs, new and old, that speak of the power and the beauty and the glory and the wonder of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're thankful that we don't have to grasp around in the dark wondering, is this true? Is it a fable? Uh, you settled that beyond question. But we're most thankful today that the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ has been applied to our lives by grace through faith. And that no matter how we may struggle with our sin, we have this hope that because Christ died and rose again, we by faith can know that we stand not guilty. Accepted as if we had your very goodness on us. Not for anything we could do, but all because of who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do. Oh, Lord, help us to live with hope and victory. And I pray for those here who have not yet confessed Christ as their Lord and pray that soon they will. For your glory and for their good, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's